Okay, welcome everybody. Um, we are honored to host today uh, Dr. Abigail Bordner from the current, current Institute in New York University, United States. Abigail is a Simon Society Junior Fellow working with Dr. Laura Zana at the Current Institute for Mathematical Sciences at NYU. At current, she's working on data driving data driving approaches for improving ocean sub mesoscale parameterizations as well as for sea level applications. Abigail received her PhD from Brown University working with Dr. Bailor Fox Kemper on improving the theory of parameterization of sub mesoscale flows and how they interact with surface boundary layer turbulence. Abigail also earned a master's degree at the Applied Mathematics at Brown University, in addition to a master in Atmospheric Sciences from Tel Aviv University. So thank you very much, Abigail, and thank you for wake, uh, waking up early at New York. And uh, today, um, Abigail is going to talk about improving the effects of sub mesoscale in climate models where they are not resolved. So thank you, and the, and the podium is yours. Thank you very much, and thank you for inviting me today. Um, I'm excited to meet everyone. So um, I'm going to be talking about a compilation of my work for my PhD and uh, my postdoc right now on improving the effects of ocean sub scales in climate models, um, where they are not resolved. And uh, this is work that's done in collaboration with uh, m score Lines, which is a um, machine learning for earth sciences uh, collaboration, um, as well as based on my PhD from Brown, which was uh, in, uh, in collaboration with the Gulf of Mexico Research Initiative. So before I start talking, um, oh, I'll just mention that I'm gonna minimize the, the video. So if, if anyone has a question, please let me know. So you can tell me the schedule and we'll follow. Okay, so. Um, okay, so before I start talking about the details of climate models and what types of parameterizations, so, I think that's what Alyssa. Yeah. So, um, I just wanted to point out a little bit about what are sub scale flows, in case people aren't familiar, and uh, what are the type of um, pro properties that we're trying to capture in climate models that are important um, on the large scale. So, so mesoscale flows can generally be categorized as um, ocean flows on the order of roughly one kilometer to 10 kilometers. Um, some features tend to be smaller, some larger. Um, and the ones that, that I'm gonna be focusing on today are surface of mesoscale flows. So here's an example of a chlorophyll concentration given from satellite imagery. And um, here are examples of some of the mesoscale features uh, such as a filament, which is these long streaks fronts, which are sharp density interfaces, which I'll be talking about quite a lot soon, and submesoscale eddies, which are vortices um, that are on these uh, smaller scales that tend to be confined to the upper uh, ocean mix layer. Um, and submesoscales play an important role in uh, ocean atmosphere interactions. Um, they also play a very large role in the biogeochemic, uh, biogeochemical cycle. So as you can see, the chlorophyll tends to concentrate along these features, um, and there's a lot of effort on the, from the community to try to better understand the physics of these processes. Um, but as I'll also explain today, they also play an important role in how we simulate the climate system as a whole. So as many of you are familiar, the climate system is a very complex system um, involves interactions across many scales, as well as between land, ocean, atmosphere, biology, um, and in climate models or general circulation models, we're trying to really capture it all, uh, but we're limited by the climate uh, model resolution and, uh, and time stepping. So what tends to happen is that the larger scale features, um, the leading order uh, dynamics tend to be well resolved, whereas anything that's too small, fast, or complex um, needs to be accounted for by a parameter in the model. These are known as parameterizations. And the effort really lies into reducing the complexity of that uh, metric into a single parameter that depends on the larger resolved variables of the model in order to extract the physics that are important for the system. Now, um, as many of you know, the ocean uh, varies along a wide range of uh, spatial and temporal scales. So on the very large end, we've got climate variability, um, you know, that could be uh, uh, centennial or millennial time scales. Um, we can also uh, think of El Nino as uh, multi-decadal time scales. Um, and then as we start going below these larger scales, 
we hit the scales where the climate model does not necessarily resolve um, all the, the important physics. So ocean mesoscales are vertices um, that are on scales of roughly 10 to 100 kilometers. Um, they contain most of the ocean energy. Um, so in order to really understand the energy budget of, of the, the climate system, which is important, of course, for global warming um, and climate change, um, there's a lot of effort to try to, to capture those uh, features in climate models. The sub-mesoscales, which are the focus of my talk today, fall below the mesoscale. So these are on orders, as I mentioned, of roughly one kilometer um, and time scales of hours to days. So it's quite hard to observe submesoscales, scales and there are specific campaigns that are designed um, for those purposes, um, but it's also hard to resolve them because they're, they're so small and, and, uh, and fast. Um, submesoscales scales are thought to be a natural energy sink um, between the, the, the source of mesoscale and the smaller scale dissipation. Um, it's a link to boundary layer turbulence, which is generated um, by winds and waves um, and atmospheric forcing. Um, so it really kind of sits on this interface between the, the scale that contains the most energy and the smallest dissipative scales. So here's an example of what um, the kind of standard ocean models would look like. This is the eastern coast of the United States, and this is a 100 kilometer resolution uh, model. This is sea surface temperature. So this is what kind of standard climate model is used um, in order to simulate um, the ocean variables. Um, and you can see the temperature gets invected. This is a quite coarse uh, resolution model, but this is what gets used in these long um, projections, for instance, for the, climate, the future of the climate. The next generation of ocean models um, vary between 10 kilometer resolution and 25 kilometer resolution. And we can see that we've got these finer scale features um, um, coming out now. Um, if we were to zoom in even further on this subregion over here, um, we can look at what uh, one and a half kilometer resolution might be. This is now vorticity, um, which is um, a metric of rotation um, at the surface. Um, this is when we, we can think of, it's known as a submesoscale permitting simulation. So we've got some submesoscale features. Um, we probably don't capture the very small ones, but um, you can really see these kind of smaller scale features pop out. And finally, if we were to zoom even further, this is a, a 500 meter resolution. Um, and here we would probably capture the bulk of the submesoscales as well as some boundary layer turbulence. And I think the most important point I'm trying to make here is we're still very far from what the coarse resolution climate models look like. And there are important physical properties of these small scales that are very important for the large scale dynamics. So we need to understand how to reduce this complexity into a single grid point um, in these models that, that still capture the physical essence. So um, the most important role probably that some mesoscales play in climate simulations is related to the ocean mixed layer. So the ocean mixed layer is the uppermost layer in the ocean. It directly interacts with the atmosphere. So it's affected by winds, waves, precipitation, heating, cooling, really everything that probably many of you know from actually going out to sea. Um, and due to, to this interaction with the atmosphere, it tends to be very well mixed and very turbulent. But how well mixed it is and how turbulent it is will determine how deep this mixed layer gets. Now in climate simulations, that's really important because accurately representing these fluxes between the atmosphere and the ocean is really crucial for capturing um, how, for instance, temperature and carbon um, get uh, transported between the ocean and the atmosphere, which will determine uh, these future climate scenarios. However, many of these processes in the ocean mixed layer tend to be very small, fast, and complex. So they get parameterized in climate models, they're unresolved. Um, and here is an example of what the buoyancy equation might look like conceptually in a climate model. So the, the overbar um, terms are the resolution of the model. Um, and anything that falls below that can be uh, thought is, is uh, represented here by a prime. So what this really says is that we've got these terms of subgrid fluxes. So they're, they're fall below the grid of a climate simulation. These are the parameterizations that we're trying to capture. And in the mixed layer case, we're really trying to capture the, the fluxes that go between the atmosphere and the ocean. Um, the, the current of mesoscale parameterization, so how they're implemented in climate models, that they have one most important role, which is that they're meant to represent the positive uh, fluxes um, that oppose these boundary layer turbulent fluxes. So it's this interplay between what's happening at the surface from winds and waves and what the submesoscales are doing that's restratifying the mixed layer 
that's giving these effective metric and climate models eventually. So in the first part of my talk, I'm going to represent, I'm going to discuss a physics-based approach to representing these fluxes and specifically how we can connect between boundary layer turbulence and submesoscales in climate models, because we know that it's this um, interaction between the two that's important. So um, before I get started, the, I wanted to you know, show some, some real live uh, images of submesoscale fronts. These are a very important part of the parameterization. Um, so fronts uh, are, can generally be described as a very sharp interface between two bodies of fluid. So this image here is from the Gulf of Mexico, where we've got the, the fresh, warm Mississippi, sorry, um, river pouring into the cold and dense um, and saltier um, Gulf waters. And we get these very sharp interfaces that form. Um, and you can see this, this uh, boat for sale, um, just really how sharp uh, these fronts are. Um, fronts are also very important for transporting uh, properties. So this is oil from the deep horizon oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico a few years ago. And you can see that that this front is really uh, uh, carrying along um, a, a lot of this oil that gets concentrated along it. Um, also important to note is the scale of this front. So look at this ship is much larger um, and these fronts can, can vary quite drastically in width, um, which is a very important part of its stability, uh, which I'll get into in a little bit. Um, this here is sea ice that's being also transported along uh, a submesoscale front. It's being squeezed by these larger mesoscale eddies, uh, which are found to be an important um, process related to the onset, which is known as frontogenesis. If we were to cross through uh, a front, we would see, um, first of all, we get these uh, tilted isopicknels. There is also an overturning circulation that's associated with um, the submesoscale front which is very important for the biogeochemical cycle. It brings up uh, nutrients from the ocean interior near the surface. And there are many fisheries that tend to feed along fronts. Um, and and that, that's a whole separate community that studies it, but um, it's also a very important part of, um, of the cycle. And many of you have been following the news um, in the US lately. Uh, we had a very cold front come in last week. Um, so here is what um, that looked like from, from the atmospheric perspective. So you get these very sharp interfaces uh, between very cold water coming in from, uh, cold, sorry, air coming in from the Arctic and warmer air um, from the mid-latitudes and these extremely sharp fronts can bring in a very cold temperature very quickly. So we had a drop of, it went from plus 15 Celsius to minus 15 Celsius within one day. Um, so that's a very drastic uh, example. Um, but again, it's the same, it's the same uh, property in the ocean, just, uh, just in a different type of fluid. Okay, so what does this look like in models and why are these fronts important? Um, the mixed layer eddy parameterization is representing the, this restratification process. So these positive fluxes in climate models. And it's developed to represent um, these, the formation of mixed layer eddies. Um, so these are instabilities that form along these fronts. I won't get too much into the details, um, but the way it's represented in models is by this overturning stream function um, that strongly depends on how wide the front is, so LF. Um, how, wide, how wide the front is, as you, you notice in those previous images, can really vary quite a lot in the ocean. Um, however, in the previous uh, um, versions of the, the parameterization, these were set to either be a constant um, or to be dependent on the deformation radius, which, which has been found to be um, something that's not reliable enough um, because that depends on external parameters where we know uh, the fronts really interact a lot with boundary layer turbulence. So the, the kind of last part of my PhD was focused on can we, can we come up with a better uh, relationship for this frontal width um, and how can we connect it with boundary layer turbulence, which we know uh, is, is how it gets determined. So um, there were a few different parts uh, related to the study. Um, and, and there was a part of it that was related to a theoretical um, um, exploration to understand how different fluxes can interact with fronts. Um, this is known as, as frontogenesis, which um, is, is uh, thought of as the onset of, of uh, these uh, sharper fronts. Um, and it was found that the vertical turbulent fluxes, so stuff that are related to vertical processes, can actually um, strengthen the front and lead to sharper fronts. Whereas horizontal properties, uh, um, hor processes, sorry, uh, horizontal turbulent fluxes are associated with what's known as the frontal arrest. So where the front will um, stay fixed at a certain width. 
And it's both this sharpening and, and um, widening of the front, which is what we might observe um, in real life. So um, to capture these different uh, uh, interactions, I followed what's known as a turbulent thermal wind balance. So if you're familiar with the, the regular thermal wind balance, it, it's a, a connection between the buoyancy gradient and the vertical shear. Um, and this can be found in, in uh, kind of larger scale oceanic flows as well as in the atmosphere. Um, but for the submesoscales, it's been suggested that there is also a, a vertical viscosity term. So this is representing, for instance, wind stress that's being applied to the ocean surface. Um, and the waves and, and wind stress that are associated with that can generate what uh, can be thought of as an eddy viscosity. So we followed through this, um, this relationship and we made sure that we, we held uh, consistent all the, all the parameters that are related to both submesoscales and boundary layer turbulence. And we came up with this new scaling law um, that relates the frontal width to the, the turbulence um, parameters that help set it. So in climate models, this is set as U star and W star, which represent the friction velocity and convective velocity, as well as the boundary layer depth, um, which is also associated with, uh, with uh, winds and, uh, and convection. So we came up with this new scaling, you know, doesn't even make sense. Um, and uh, there were several different steps that we went about to, to explore this. So the first one is testing in large eddy simulations. So large eddy simulations are these very high resolution um, um, process uh, models where um, we're able to resolve both boundary layer turbulence and the larger submesoscale flow. So it's really this perfect test bed uh, to be able to, to capture these different um, effects that we're looking for. Um, we had a whole suite of different kinds, um, which uh, either had you know, convection or winds and waves or smaller eddies. And, and we in each one of these different cases, we measured how wide the front gets, how, depth, how deep is the boundary layer turbulence, what are the different uh, forcing parameters? And then we were able to come up with um, this uh, log log plot, which compares the predicted versus measured frontal width. Um, and, and we found that, you know, especially for simulations that weren't really designed for this, um, we got a relatively uh, nice result, uh, which is saying basically that our, our uh, scaling isn't crazy. The next step was to see, you know, does this even make sense in, in real observations? Um, so we turned to a few different locations around the world where there have been some mesoscale specific campaigns. Um, so this includes the Bay of Bengal, the California current system, and the, the Porcupine Abyssal uh, Plain. And in each one of these, there are observations from the surface uh, given by moorings, um, which can give us these U star and W star uh, parameters. Um, we then use a, a general ocean turbulence model, which it predicts the depth of the boundary layer based on those conditions. Um, and we were able to get a new estimate for frontal width, which is uh, uh, founded in observations. Um, so we found that the frontal width is roughly in the order of one kilometer. Um, it tends to be a little sharper, which is also consistent with the observations found in those locations. Finally, um, we looked at uh, global uh, climate models, which have very um, very high resolution uh, horizontal grids. Um, and I'll get back to these types of simulations in a little bit. But um, on a global scale, uh, we again, we wanted to see what, what is the distribution of, of frontal width um, compared to the old one. And um, this here is, is the latitude. And we can see that on the, on, uh, the large, sorry, the, the old frontal width um, tends to be at smallest about one kilometer wide, um, whereas the new frontal width can reach much sharper fronts, um, especially as we get to higher latitudes, which has been something that's been um, uh, hard, to, hard to get in, uh, in simulations. So the next step um, after, you know, just, just as a proof of concept to see if these even make sense, is we wanted to see what happens when we implement this in, in real climate models. So we've got um, this frontal width that then goes back into the parameterization and there are another a few additional adjustments that I didn't mention, but we did come up with a, a new parameterization that is able to um, interact differently with the boundary layer turbulence. So we turned to CSM, which is Community Earth System Model um, operated by NCAR. Um, POP is their uh, ocean um, model within CSM. And um, we then implemented it. So we, we coded up this new parameterization. Uh, we linked it to these boundary layer turbulence, which is a separate scheme and climate model. Um, and then we ran two different cases. Uh, we ran a coupled and a forced simulation. So coupled simulations interacts. It means that the ocean and atmosphere interact with each other. 
So this is important because we know we have this connection with uh, boundary layer turbulence that's associated with winds and waves and convection. Um, the force simulation means that the atmospheric forcing comes directly from observations and then the ocean responds to that. So we can get different, um, different uh, conceptual uh, understandings from these different frameworks. So um, this here is an example of what the, the new parameterization, the new, um, sorry, the new frontal width compared to the old one would look like. Um, and we get, we get similar results to uh, that high resolution model before. Um, specifically in CSM, there's a cap for five kilometers. So you can really see how artificial this last uh, parameterization was where we get much sharper fronts um, with this new um, with this new scaling. Um, so here, here's uh, we we studied the direct uh, impact uh, on climate through the mixed layer depths. Um, so as I mentioned, this is an important part in climate simulations. This is where the best scales play the the most important role. So how much does the climate? How much does the mixed layer depths change in the climate model after we implement this new adjustment? Um, so on the on the top right here, we've got a comparison between mixed layer depth from the new parameterization as well as compared um, to the control case, which is um, where there's no change. And the most important thing is that we see there's a, it's not drastically different. So this means that this doesn't break the model, which is very important. Um, it also generally can be uh, compared to observations, which we can see in all cases. So observations is on top left, which is given from uh, from drifters. Um, this is the, the new versus old in coupled and forced simulations. And in all cases, at least from the eye, we can see that it generally resembles um, observations. <laughs> so as a reminder, the, the coupled simulations will provide this active feedback with the atmosphere, whereas the forced simulations are more useful for comparing with observations down the road. This entire panel is for the global winter, so both in, in the northern and, and southern hemisphere. Um, the same can be done for, for global summer, and these results are, are quite the same, where we can see general resemblance to observations um, from all these different cases. There are, though, changes, um, and the places, the regions where there are changes are important uh, for, from a climate perspective. Um, so this top panel is, uh, is the couple simulations, the difference between the mixed layer depth in the old and the new. And the bottom panels are the force simulations. And the most important result here probably is that the, the equatorial um, um, equator uh, tends to change in the different cases. This has been something that's been very difficult to achieve. There is a known bias in um, the equatorial mixed layer depth. Um, it tends to be much deeper. And what we found here is that we are able to uh, reach a shallower um, a mixed layer depth um, there are also other regions that, that have quite a lot of changes, for instance, the, the North Atlantic and the Pacific, um, the Southern Ocean. So we are still exploring the extent of these changes, but we are seeing non-zero effects in places that are important. So I'm going to give a mini summary here, and then I'm going to turn to um, the second part of my talk, which is related to a different approach. So we've developed a a scaling law um, for arrested frontal width as, as a function of turbulent fluxes. Um, this scaling is found consistent with large eddy simulations in parameters drawn from observations, as well as in a high resolution um, simulation. And the results from implementing it in the climate model, so CSM, will reveal uh, changes in mixed layer depth bias. And this is something, as I mentioned, that we are um, extending now into a, a larger climate uh, model ensemble. Okay, so coming back to um, backing up a little bit again, um, let's remember why the metascales are, are really important. So we're talking about these uh, fluxes. We're talking about the interactions with boundary layer turbulence. And in the previous half of the talk, we, we uh, discussed a physics-based approach for connecting these. So that was, as you notice, you know, very um, rooted in theory. Um, it, it, it started from this uh, scaling law. Um, but, but now in the second part, and this is what I'm doing now, my postdoc, um, we're trying to see, you know, can we actually get different results um, or, or come up with a better uh, parameterization that's, that's given directly from data. So data where sub scales are resolved or permitted um, will be able to resolve all the processes and not only this single uh, positive flux, which is what that previous version was focused on. So the data I'm using uh, for the second part um, is data from a sub scale permitting simulation. So recall the, the climate, um, the standard climate models have a resolution about hundred kilometers 
the MIT GCM LLC 4320 um, has a horizontal resolution of 148th of a degree, so about two kilometers. This is, you know, ultra high resolution. Um, these type of simulations are, are not anywhere near in the near future of kind of what the next generation of ocean models will be. Um, and uh, it's also, there are petabytes of uh, data stored on NASA servers. It's, it's actually quite difficult to access. And the way I've been able to access it is using these uh, open source packages uh, known as the XMIT GCM. And uh, what, what we've done is, is uh, identify these different regions around the world where submesoscales have been shown to be important. Um, so this is based on a paper by Hector Torres et al. in 2018, which studied the energetic properties of submesoscales around the world in these different regions. Um, and really motivated by, by these choices, we've, uh, we're looking at these 10 by 10 degree boxes around the world. Um, and each one of them, we are uh, sampling the data in order to generate data for training our machine learning method or the data-driven data method that I'll be presenting here. So just to review a little bit about what, what are uh, the different choices for the simulation. So it's a 148th of a degree, two kilometer horizontal resolution. Uh, we select these 10 by 10 degree domains where submesoscales are important. Um, because this simulation is so massive, there's only 14 months of data. Um, so uh, it's hourly data, but but that's too high frequency uh, for the, the processes that we're trying to capture because we need to reduce a correlation between the different samples in our training. So we've downsampled that to daily um, data. Um, and based on, on all of these different choices, we've generated uh, uh, a pool of uh, samples that we are going to use to train our neural network. So we're now going to be training um, uh, a method to predict these submesoscale induced fluxes um, directly from this data. I will just note that rather than looking at only the single uh, vertical um, positive flux um, as in the um, physics-based parameterization, here we are actually computing all three directions of fluxes uh, because we can compute them directly from the data. So we do need to pre-process the data a little bit before we um, plug it into this machine learning algorithm. Um, so up, up here, we've got these, the high resolution buoyancy field that's given uh, from the model. Um, this contains multiple scales of, of data, right? We've got the smallest submetal scales, but then we can go all the way up to planetary scales. So we need to make sure that we're only learning the submetal scales. Um, for this, we've applied a, a Gaussian filter. Um, this is given again from the GCM filters package. Um, and we've used a cutoff uh, threshold of one eighth of a degree. So this corresponds roughly to the, the largest scales of submesoscale. And we can then decompose our field into um, mesoscale and larger, which basically looks like a smooth version of um, the high resolution. And then we can uh, also get the submesoscale, which what you can really see that pops out is these are the small scale features um, that are associated with the flow. So it, for each one of the variables that we've identified to be important, um, we've averaged over the mix layer because we're looking for the average of uh, fluxes um, over the mix layer depth. And then finally, the last step is we coarsen it to a resolution of a quarter degree. So this is because we want our uh, method to uh, resemble what the climate simulations will see. So I know this is a, a little bit uh, um, of a lot of information, but if we go back to this equation, which um, represents what the climate model um, will represent, um, it's these subgrid fluxes that uh, we are trying to capture, but we want to make sure that the model is able to uh, predict them using the variables it has. So it only has these coarser resolution variables, and we need to use that in order to predict the fluxes. So the, the variables that we are using are the, the horizontal and vertical velocities at the resolution of the, of the climate model. So you can see that this is a quite coarse uh, image as well as the buoyancy. Um, and the targets, so what we're looking to predict are these subgrids, so below the grid of the model, submesoscale buoyancy fluxes. Um, so this is what's quote the truth given by the model, but it is coarsened into the resolution that the model can predict. And finally, we use a convolutional neural network, which means that we are predicting, uh, we're learning um, the relationship between these variables and the, what we want to predict. And in a sense, this is quite similar to the physics-based approach. We've got these um, larger scale variables before we had um, um, these turbulent fluxes and we had uh, the mixed layer depth. Um, and we are predicting what we think should be the, the um, fluxes. 
So in this case, it's the same, except the, the relationship is now determined by this neural network. So here are some results um, from training. Now, this is a project that's uh, still ongoing. Um, and a lot of our um, um, the, the things that have been delaying this a little bit is trying to get the data because, um, as I mentioned, it's, it's very massive. So we've trained, this is just an example from um, a <clears throat> training what's known as a fully convolutional neural network. Um, there are five hidden layers. The kernel is size three. If anyone's an interest, then we can, we can talk about the details later. Um, but we have roughly 3,000 samples um, from, from those different locations around the world that I mentioned. Uh, we try to use as many as we can um, for the training of the, the network. Um, this is because, you know, from machine learning um, world, 3,000 samples is not in, in the higher range. So we want to make sure we are learning as many features as possible. Um, and then 10% of the data gets um, put aside. And this is unseen data by the model that we're using to test our method. So uh, the results shown here are from the unseen data. So this is how well um, the model uses a target. Um, so this is the, the truth that's given by the model and it can predict it based on the training, um, but this is unseen data. So what really stands out, you know, this doesn't, it's not a one-to-one -one comparison. Um, the prediction is a smooth, smooth version of the target. This also comes up in other, <clears throat> other properties um, that we look at from the results. So the right-hand column is a uh, spectra. Spectra is a, uh, spectral properties are, are a measure of variability in the flow. Um, so what we can see is on the large scale, we, we sort of match up, but as we get into the smaller scales, um, we're tapering off um, and we're not doing um, as well of a job as learning the small scale features, uh, which is also you know, similar to seeing the smooth version. Um, in, the, in the PDF, so the statistics, um, we can also compare you know, the target versus prediction, um, and we can see that we get these more skewed um, PDFs, which is again showing you know, we're not capturing um, the smaller scales. We're, we're more um, normalized um, um, average towards the mean. One interesting feature that, that, um, that I thought was interesting is, is uh, that the vertical fluxes tend to learn um, better the tails of the positive fluxes. So the network is picking up that these vertical buoyancy fluxes, which is what the physics-based approach was learning, um, is really an important feature of this problem. So what we're doing now is uh, we're exploring how to implement this in climate models. Um, if we implement this network itself um, to the way the, the climate model um, progresses over time, there might sometimes are issues with stability and it's not guaranteed. Um, so that's one approach that we're looking to, to extend. But in addition, um, there are ways that you can tweak uh, the method to resemble um, other existing parameterizations in models. So it's, we're looking at um, a diffusivity form, so like a down gradient flux, as well as um, a stream function, which is uh, similar to the overturning circulation by the uh, physics-based approach. So there are different ways that we can frame this that can resemble the way um, parameterizations are already implemented in the model, um, and, and perhaps it will be more stable. So here's a mini summary of, of where this work stands so far. Um, um, we're looking at a different approach now for the submesoscale parameterizations. Um, here we are uh, using fluxes that are directly computed from the ultra high resolution um, MIT GCM uh, simulation. Uh, the fluxes uh, are used to uh, predict, um, to be predicted by the forced resolution variables. We are finding that the predictions are smoother compared to the target, but they do resemble in larger scale statistics. Um, as I mentioned, we are in the process of um, transporting, uh, tra transmitting more data um, locally so we can um, collect it uh, for more samples, um, which will allow us to also go uh, deeper in these neural networks, which uh, will help us find, learn these finer scale features. Um, and finally, we are developing different approaches for GCM implementations, um, which correspond to uh, other relevant ocean parameterizations. Um, okay, so so before I, I go on to my uh, final summary, I just wanted to advertise um, Climate Match Academy, which is uh, an initiative that uh, I've created and co-founded with uh, with many other colleagues. Um, this is a summer school that's launching um, next summer in 2023. Uh, it's going to be a virtual program. Um, we are uh, working really hard on trying to be um, inclusive to different time zones, um, and uh, there's there, the idea is to teach students uh, the fundamentals of climate using open source Python-based Python tools 
Um, so if you're interested, if you're a student and interested in learning how to access or analyze or interpret climate data um, from all different uh, sorts, uh, we've also got components um, that are related to making an impact uh, using the data um, and analysis that you will learn in the program. Um, we, we'd love to have uh, more students. There's also many ways to get involved and um, help us design these tutorials that we're still in the process. Um, so if this is something that um, people are interested in, I would also love to follow up on it later, but um, also please visit our website to learn more. Okay, so so uh, this is my summary summary. Um, uh, so mesoscale fluxes play an important role in ocean mixed layer dynamics. Um, parameterizing these effects in models is very crucial for climate simulations as they are um, really determine how the atmosphere and ocean interact. Um, I've discussed two, two recent parameterization approaches. One is a physics-based approach that's given by turbulent parameters in the model. The other is a data-driven approach that's uh, using ultra-high resolution simulations um, to train the model to predict, quote, the truth. Um, and we are uh, planning implementation in ocean models to be able to compare these different approaches. Um, and finally, also a comprehensive study to compare the results from the models with observations to really understand the full impact um, on climate simulations. So that's the end of my talk. Um, I'd be happy to answer questions at this point. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Abigail. Really, really interesting talk. Um, and uh, somehow also enlightening for our students in our department. Um, I would like to open the, um, the podium for questions from the audience. Go ahead. I don't see all the faces, so just jump in. Don't be shy. She doesn't bite. I have a question. Oh. Um, maybe I didn't catch it or anything, but how do you physically measure uh, fronts in order to put them in the model? And uh, how do you do it? <laughs> I don't know if even it's uh, the right question, but. Uh... No, it's a great, it's a great question. So this is, this is the, was kind of the problem of the first parameterization is that you can't you can't really measure them right um so this is why we come up with this new scaling um so in in the original parameterization this is just a number but um we use theory to de derive a different number that um we, we think better represents the physics so so you can't measure them um or we don't have enough measurements i'm sorry um and and i know that there are people that are actively working on that um, but that's that's been kind of the weak part of this uh, of this implementation. The model is that we we didn't have a very good understanding of how wide these really get. So in theory, once people have better measurements of this, the model can be improved. For correct, yeah. and hopefully the measurements are consistent with my scaling. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, and it was yeah. a great talk. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, more questions? I'll go back to the summary. So no questions. Easy. I, I um, first of all, thank you. It was a, a very good talk. Very enlightening because we see all these uh, developments in terms of mesoscale uh, imaging and modeling. Um, question that uh, really may, might be an ignorant question, but uh, how does a, your model of the mixed layer uh, interact with the deeper water level? Or does it interact with the deeper water level? Basically, yeah, there is the global circulation is the most important thing I think in climate, right? Um, yes. So, so um, the answer would be the the fluxes. So these fluxes are basically taking properties from the surface and they're they're putting them in the interior. And in the model that's you know done, there's like this uh, boundary condition. Um, but um, in practice, this is why this mixed layer depth is so important to capture because it's representing these fluxes. It's strongly linked with these fluxes between the surface and the interior. So you're, you're absolutely right that we're, we want to make sure that the ocean interior is responding to the atmospheric uh, forcing in the right way. 
Right, so, so in terms of result, do we see them actually changing the motion of the... Yeah, um, so, so this is, I've started looking at that um, and that didn't go into this paper, but uh, we're looking for instance at the overturning circulation. Um, we're looking at ideal age to be able to understand how um, uh, the, you know, the properties from the air uh, trans transmit into the ocean interior and how does that change um, based on this parameterization. And this is this kind of last study um, that, that I'm working on now. Um, but we are, we are seeing changes, you know, how strong are these changes is what we are trying to understand now. Right. Here in the Mediterranean, we were, uh, I was surprised to find out that they, they see upwelling and they see a, and they see, how do you call it, the, the other way around, the, the plunging of the water in, in places that we didn't expect. Uh, mm. I don't know how it's going on because in the oceans, basically the, the image I have in my mind of something that that uh, plunges in the in the poles and comes up in the in in the equator, but I, I'm, I'm guessing it's not really that simple. Yeah, I think that the, it's it's a leaky um, relationship. It's a leaky boundary, you, huh? Yeah, you've got these fluxes that are, and they're internal waves that also contribute to that a lot. Um, that break and then they trans transport um, like heat and and uh, stuff like that between the layers. So on an average sense, I think you're right. And then when you get into the small, smaller time scales, you would get these fluxes that, that come out. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Thank you for the question. Thank you, Itzik. More questions? Well, if there are no more questions, we will uh, uh, free you to your day in New York. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much again. And a guy. Uh, have a wonderful start for the new year. Thank you. Everyone. <laughs> and uh, all of you, we are meeting next week. Okay. Bye, everybody. Thank bye. you. Bye.